Ketanya Prakash Yogi, Director of the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, Mr. Ashik Paramchand, Ms. Zainab Priya Dara, Mr. Ish Paramchand, Dr. Reina Abraham, Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, Mr. Kiran Singh, distinguished guests and online viewers, Namaskar and welcome to episode 9 of Pustaka Lok, A Light of a Book, with a book discussion on the book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey, by medical student and author, Mr. Ashik Paramchand. Today, to commence uh, our program, I would like to invite Mr. Ashik Paramchand, a medical student and author of The Great Medical Student Odyssey, for his remarks today on episode 9. Namaste and welcome, Ashik Ji. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, first of all, um, I, I want to thank everyone for their immense support in terms of my, with regards to my writing, and thank you again for the opportunity. Um, when I wrote the book, it was in my second year of medical school, and I thought to myself, how, what do I want to achieve at the end of six years? Six years is a long time for medical training, and um, it's about a quarter of my life so far. And there are a lot of great stories that can be told in those interim. Um, in medicine, we have the unique opportunity in that we, we see immense suffering and immense joy from people on, from all walks of life, um, from neonates to the elderly. I think I'd like to start off first by making reference to, to an anecdote. Um, many years ago, when I was in my, um, my first year of medical school, I was in India with my family. And now I came across a TB hospital with, um, with, with, with crumbling foundations. It was, they were, they were, the resources were minimal. And we were walking through the streets, and what we know, I noticed was a, a significant contrast between um, high-rise, up, um, upmarket buildings and this, this lone, collapsed TB hospital. And I heard a blood-curdling scream emanate from within. And it was from a young woman who was, who was suffering from TB. And I never really forgot that, that scream. Um, I think... That's the first lesson that, that inspired me to write the book. We, in medicine, we have the opportunity to connect with people in unexpected ways. And medicine is more than about science. It's about people and how we connect to people. And many of these ways can be unexpected. So from then, I've always made it an effort to, to, to get to know people better because health is a holistic um, is, is very holistic. We need to be, um, we, we need to have a good understanding of um, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. And in order to do that, we have to explore those areas. So in the, one of the insights in the book that I advocate for is that anybody involved in, in, in health care should get to know society better. Because by getting to know people better, we can care for them better. Um, that it can be anything, um, 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 going, g greeting a complete stranger, um, um, taking the extra time to listen to, some, to somebody that you never thought you'd ever talk to. Um, it, um, it can be um, do, um, doing martial arts, playing the piano, which, is in, which are other forms of therapy. I recall one time when um, I met a few students from Israel who completed their uh, military training. And they introduced me to the idea of music therapy, which is something we only learn about in books, but we never, we never see in person. So that was one insight that I really felt compelled to share with medical students, is that you must get out there, know, know people in society, and form stronger relationships with them. Because by understanding people better, we understand healthcare better and can change the system. And third insight that I, want to, that I wanted to focus on in the book is the idea of vulnerability. We as students in healthcare um, suffer immensely, whether it be financially, academically, mentally. Um, people only see the glamorous side of medicine in pop culture. They think, yes, you get you get all this money, you get well, you get well respected, but that's not always it. There's a, there are two sides to every coin, um, and with that suffering comes realization. Um, under intense stress, we have choices. We can either collapse or we can make ourselves stronger. 
And I thought it'd be relevant to mention to mention it here since um, since so much of our strength comes from religion and culture. Um, for 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 me, that helped me attach a philosophical significance to what I'm doing, which make which it leads on to my following point. I encourage all medical students and everybody involved in healthcare to ask themselves, why are we doing what we do? Sure, we say we want to help people, but then the question is, what are people like? Which refers to which links to my previous points about getting to know people better. So. Um, in terms of, of, of summarizing my insights from the book, um, one, it's important to form strong, healthy relationships with people both inside and outside of medicine. Two, is that you have to love what you do and find meaning to it by attaching a philosophical significance to it. This can be anything from what you derive culturally or through you, your experiences in life, the challenges that you have endured. I think as young people, we need to, we need to work around answering that question and finding purpose in our art. And then um, reflecting on vulnerability. We're not perfect. Um, we make mistakes. We, we, we see death, we see birth, and sometimes we don't know how to handle it. And I, I encourage anybody, whether it's in healthcare or outside of healthcare, to reflect on their vulnerability. Because we, we don't often do that enough, to understand our weaknesses in order to become stronger. Um, and I think to conclude, a final point that I wanted to mention in the book is that, yes, it actually relates to the title. Medical school and medicine in itself is a great odyssey, but it is a great odyssey only because we choose to make it so. Opportunities won't come, uh, just come to us. Uh, we must actively take them on in order to improve ourselves understand our weaknesses, strong former, form stronger relationships, and understand society and global health better. I think those are some main insights that I wanted to share from the book. Thank you so much, Ashik Ji, for your insights and remarks on your book, uh, The Great Medical Student Odyssey. Our next guest speaker is Ms. Zainab Priya Dala, an author and host from Turb. Namaskar, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Ms. Sristi, uh, the author, Ashik Premchand, and the distinguished guests on this panel. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide commentary on the book by Ashik Premchand called The Great Medical Student Odyssey. Congratulations, Ashik. I think that uh, at the outset, you have pr uh, produced a book that is not only motivational, but is also educational and provides a snapshot into the life of a medical student and future doctor, which many people, not only medical students, will be able to t use uh, as a motivational text. I want to start off this uh, commentary by talking a little bit about memoir as a genre. And the reason I do this is because apart from Ashik's book being a work of motivation, I think that what he has done is entered into the genre of memoir. Um, the master memoirist, Mary Carr, who wrote a memoir of her life growing up in the deep south um, of South Carolina in the United States, uh, talks about memoir being a very personal interior space with memories pieced together that the reader never loses sight of the intention of the writer. In Ashik's book, his intention is made very clear in that he sets out at the outset exactly what he intends to do with his book. He wants it to be a snapshot and he also wants it to motivate future uh, medical students. Um, often when it comes to memoir, we say that it is very subjective. History is told from the viewpoint of the victor. We've heard of this term many times. The memoirist or the writer of memoir needs to state out, outright if he is a victor in his own story, is he the antagonist in the story, or is he the agitator in the story? Often, if the memoir writer retains the point of view of watcher, 
we miss the nuances of his positioning. Ashit has successfully uh, navigated this by stating at the outset that he is not merely a watcher, he is also an active agent in his own story. Um, we begin to ask ourselves as we um, delve deeper into Ashik's book, not so much uh, about the medical facts and the medical um, terminology that he very eloquently places, but we begin many times to ask ourselves, who is this person that is telling us this particular story and why do we want to hear this story? The 2019 memoir, Your Heart, My Hands by Dr. Arun K. Singh, a cardiothoracic surgeon who came as a poor immigrant boy to the United States and became one of the most prominent cardiac surgeons uh, in United States history, brings to my mind the uh, detailing that Dr. Singh does when he describes the crippling setbacks and the place that he comes from as a young boy growing up in India in absolute poverty and eventually ending up at a position where he's considered one of the most prominent heart surgeons in the world. Here, the author, Dr. Singh, details that pivot point of courage using his medical training as the lens. This gives us an idea of his reality. It makes him extremely re relatable. His climb from being a fearful boy in a village to a confident man who is performing heart surgeries in America draws us into the story because as human beings, we enjoy the story arc as much as we enjoy the lesson of determination. The facts and the figures of medical life is important, but what is equally, if not more important, is watching the hero's journey. We end up cheering for an author as he is sets himself up initially as an underdog. And in um, many memoirs where doctors or medical personnel write about their lives, we move beyond only wanting to know about the medical details and we want to understand the human story behind that. Um, with Ashik Premchand's memoir, we slowly begin to see glimpses of the humanity and the story, the backstory of Ashik Premchand. Beyond the medical student, beyond the public health worker, beyond the commentator, we begin to see glimpses of who he is as a human being. Secondary to the human story is the medical story. Much like uh, Singh, who I mentioned, uh, Prem Chand has an innate feel for medicine and public health. That's quite evident in the, his descriptions of patients and his descriptions of how he engages with his colleagues, uh, his brother, uh, his father, who is also a medical doctor, but I think de beyond that, we begin to see that he has an eye that goes deeper, that is deeper than a medical textbook. He absorbs his medical skill into a very personal human account. Uh, Ashik's use of language and all of its nuances is his greater literary skill. He knows when to theorize, when to add large rhetoric, when to add um, his openly self-deprecating and glib oftentimes funny comments and we begin to see as the millennial that he clearly is we are never bored with his story because of the language that he uses it's extremely relatable it is not high-ended which we always find in many people who write medical terminology it is something that we feel as if we are drawn into a conversation with someone that we are sitting across from and so in that way uh, we know he's not. we are not being lectured to, and the prospective medical students out there are going to feel this, that they're not being lectured to. There is no prescription, per se, as to how you should behave as a medical student. Ashik advises in his writing, but he also sets up that he is not perfect. I suppose the young medical students whose book this is targeted towards will find comfort in this being a manual. The other reader, who is not a medical student, will be left wanting a little more. 
there's a tenuous title of where this manuscript is placed. Is it memoir or is it self-help book? Ashik is walking this tightrope. Uh, and in it, I think that one of the things that we need to look for, perhaps in his future writing, and I do hope that he writes in the future, we need to understand his innate prejudices. What is his innate subjectivity from where he comes from and how he is able to cast an eye on the life of the patient that he talks about. We need to be able to understand him as a very well-rounded and relatable memoirist. Thank you, Zainab, for sharing those insights on Ashik Ji's book. Our next guest speaker is Mr. Ish Parmchand, a medical student in Devon. It's an honor to be here, and it's um, I'm, I'm very happy to speak about my twin brother's book. It, it's a great achievement because um, Medicine is something which um, it's, uh, it's a great undertaking for anyone who wants to get into the medical field. Um, it's hours of work and um, hours of studying and hours of um, really getting used to the public health care system for what it is. But what I've learned after having six years under my belt in the system of medicine is that the only way you're going to get past <laughs> medical school and hospital is if you really, really enjoy it. And medicine is a lifestyle. A lifestyle because um, it reflects your perspective. A perspective is a personal journey that's formed from life's precious and precious moments. And um, I'd like to reflect as well on uh, many of the things that um, we do experience in the hospital. But um, one thing when we are at the hospital, in the evenings. We often endure 36 hour calls um, or even a little bit longer. And um, there's one thing that is with you during the late hours of the night when you are with patients. And um, that is that is your passion for the course and um, why you are doing it. You always have to reflect and ask yourself why. Um, and when you're there um, treating patients, um, you have to be open to everything because learning does not occur in the classroom. It's, it's not limited to lectures. And the only way you can truly learn about something is to sense it, is to immerse yourself completely into that moment and live the moment and um, truly speak to the patient. Take the blood um, if you're doing a blood investigation and do the examination with all of your heart. And I found that that's a great way to to learn as much as you can in the hospital and to truly realize your full potential in the medical field. And as my brother did say, uh, medicine isn't all books. It isn't all science. Um, it, isn't all, it isn't all studying at um, your table for hours on end. And it definitely isn't um, a lifestyle where you don't have um, versatility. Medicine lends itself to so many other things. You don't have to only study all the time because everything complements itself. And that goes on to a little bit more of a philosophical level, because um, the more you do, the more you learn and the more you find out. And it's usually faster that way because you expose yourself to more challenges in a short period of time and you grow as a person. So I often found that um, the hobbies that we engage in, as Ashik has mentioned, whether it be music or piano or even martial arts and Tai Chi, those type of things are for leisure, of course. But when you truly put your intention to do excellently in them, um, you learn more about yourself, you learn more about what you should improve on, and that, that impacts on your way you manage patients. You, you realize where you should improve in your communication skills, your interpersonal skills between people, and you learn in every way possible to manage a patient optimally. And many principles of Eastern culture fall into Ashik's book because most of the places we've traveled to um, in the Far East, whether it be India, the rural um, outskirts of China, or even Japan, we found that the code of um, Eastern culture um, does lend itself to the way of the warrior, which in the Japanese culture is the way of the samurai. And they often, with simplicity, comes great rewards, and that reflects your, your outlook on life. It teaches the way of the warrior and 
they have a simple saying there um, that um, I thought it was great for the medical setting in South Africa because we have human immunodeficiency virus or HIV and tuberculosis to deal with, among many other diseases. But the saying goes, if there's, if there's no one to help, go out and find someone to help. And it's a simple rule in Bushido code that um, appears in many of the books, um, Tao Te Ching, um, Art of War by Sun Tzu, and of course, the great medical student Odyssey does lend itself to many of those principles. And I've found that by appreciating everything around you in any setting, whether you're in a developing setting or a developed, being open to the environment and accepting everything around you um, helps you grow as a person, become more humble, love and thrive. And the med medicine is, is truly demanding, but it is worth every minute. Yes. Um, I must say it was an honor speaking and thank you very much. It was an honor sharing uh, my personal thoughts and I really, really do hope um, that it did um, help give a little bit of insight on a doctor in a developing world and what we are doing to try to help it. Thank you so much, Ishchi, for your remarks today on episode nine of Pustaka Log on the book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Reina Abraham, a medical doctor, and she'll be giving us a little insight as well on the book. Greetings to one and all. I'm really honored to be invited to share a few words as a guest speaker on this platform. Before I begin, may I first congratulate my student Ashik on a huge milestone of writing and publishing a book. I'm so glad to see that his talent has been recognized and the Indian consulate has given him this platform to share his experiences. That is fantastic. I read the initial parts of the book and it was such a delight to read something refreshing. All in all, the book was easy to read a motivating and inspiring book for all interested in knowing about the exciting adventures that medical school offers through the lens of a medical student. Ashik has a way with describing experiences with such grace, humor, and respect. It keeps you reading and sustains your attention. Ashik's flair with words and the use of quotations that are so apt makes the reading very interesting. A gifted writer indeed. It was good to see how his worldly experiences and hobbies have shaped the way he has handled studying medicine. Amazing. Lots of pointers to motivate others to study medicine. Reading Ashik's experiences in medical school, from how it all started to the various adventures and the learnings along the way, brought back loads of nostalgia of my medical school days nearly 30 years back. And I'm sure his experiences would inspire others to fall in love with medicine. I noted his experiences in clinical skills and especially comments about how a doctor should be an actor and a detective to put together the various pieces of evidence towards making a clinical diagnosis. This took me back to my first communication skills teaching session with his class group at the clinical skills lab at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine. More importantly was his affirmation of how medical school ingrained in him an important life skill that is effective interpersonal communication skills, which forms the basis of developing trustful relationships with patients and colleagues. I actually feel like I have accomplished my goal of instilling in him the foundation of communication skills. Through Ashik's writing, I sense his passion for wanting to help others, more especially wanting to guide those interested in studying medicine to develop the right attitude and mindset required to become a good doctor. This is therapeutic both for him and for those interested in exploring the medicine as a profession. Therapeutic for him because the feeling of sharing advices and survival tips to help others is a noble idea and very satisfying. Therapeutic for those wanting to pursue the medical profession as his experiences helps relieve a lot of stress and anxiety of the unknown. 
Medicine is a vast field and studying to become a doctor can be quite a stressful experience. Ashik has shared methods that he has used to overcome the various challenges. He rightly emphasizes the importance of passion, having a curious mind, and the need to inculcate the attitudes of being physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually well-balanced to become a healthy and successful doctor. A method of overcoming personal challenges that stood out for me from the book was the importance of being empathetic to others, sharing feelings with the people closest to you, and finally, writing about your thoughts. And that is how this book came about. This brings me to the concept that I would like to share with you today, and that is how writing can be therapeutic. After a short research I did uh, with regards to this topic on the science of writing to heal, these are a few thoughts that came across me. Writing your life stories or experiences is the way to literally take control over your own story. Even if you don't consider yourself to be much of a writer, the process of writing offers scientifically proven health benefits. Writing allows you to process and cope with past events, diffuse emotionally charged memories, and redefine and transform your future. By telling your stories, you can let them go and free yourself from their burden. Dr. James Pennybaker, a psychologist at the University of Texas, has spent over 20 years studying the links between emotional experiences, language, and mental and physical health. As an expert in writing to heal, Penny Baker recommends not only expressive writing, but writing with some direction to help yourself develop an organized account of the traumatic event. Penny Baker's study shows that by converting emotions into words, your response to the memories of the traumatic event will change. Similarly, writing is an effective way of coping with anxiety and depression. Writing through emotion changes the way you think about events and you can make friends with your emotions as you learn to express them in a positive and healthy way. Writing puts emotions and memories in a place where they no longer have the ability to hurt you. It feels much safer to manage words on paper than to confront tough situations. When you're able to feel safe, you begin to heal. This emotion-focused coping boosts your psychological resilience. Writing your life stories can help you reassess current stress and past memories with new insights and clarity. This allows you to understand yourself more fully and begin to take control of processing your emotions. In other words, writing helps you build emotional resilience. According to Dr. Penny Baker's research, expressive writing for just 20 minutes a day can help you feel better. Writing has been shown to boost immune system, reduce life stress, promote healing from disease and injury, increase the lung function in asthma patients, decrease chronic pain from arthritis, cancer, and injury, and induce more restful sleep. While writing has multiple benefits for emotional and psychological healing, a study led by Elizabeth Broadbent at the University of Auckland in New Zealand added important evidence that your words can also help your physical feeling. The act of writing forces you to put words to your emotions and this intentional coherent collection of your thoughts creates a greater mind and body connection. Writing is cheap, simple, and accessible. With that in mind, life storytelling can be one of the quickest ways to address difficult or traumatic situations in your life. Writing life stories allows anyone at any level of writing ability to find a way to put tough feelings down in a healthy, safe space, mentally and physically. As you find words for your emotions, your brain finds a way to neutralize the anger, pain, and sadness you feel. 
when you discover and share your story, you find a way to make sense of experiences you've lived through, reshaping your behavior and improving your health. Pulling from studies of Penny Baker and other researchers, authors of one study show that expressive writing gives you greater access to your unconscious self where you can work through your feelings. It helps you organize your thoughts, find deeper meaning, and free yourself from the emotional baggage that might be dragging you down and keeping you from fulfilling your true purpose in life. On that note, I believe that life is a story and it's never too late to start telling yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reina Abraham, for that insight on the book, uh, The Great Student, A uh, Medical Student Odyssey. Our next guest speaker is Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, an author and educator in Durban, South Africa. Namaste and welcome, Dr. Singh. Uh, namaste to my erstwhile group of panelists, um, Dr. Yogi, Shristi, G, uh, Simpiweji, and of course, our two special guests, uh, the two brothers, the two twins, the, doctor, the, the doctors, Pramchans, or Pram, yeah, Pramchans, if I may say. Uh, it was an excellent piece of reading that I did, uh, looking at the piece of literature that you put out there. It, it's so refreshing to read, not the work of people already in the career, but people that are trying to get into the career because that is the, the threshold that you've got to cross to actually become a professional. And uh, Ashik, I'm not sure I'm gonna call you Dr. Ashik as yet. You haven't told us, <laughs> but to me you are. Uh, it is such a refreshing read, not just through uh, the eyes of a medical student, but to you as a person. Because this odyssey that you speak about is what each of us goes through in various walks of life, no matter what the profession. And I think very often at the reaching of the goal, we look back and say, this was the odyssey that I undertook to get where I am. But you actually tracked your odyssey while it was happening. And that's really a refreshing perspective, not from just a medical point of view, but from a literary point of view. Uh, I'm an academic doctor. And very often in just, I say I'm a brain doctor because I deal with academics. <laughs> But you guys are the physiological, physical, the real doctors out there. And so, hail to you on an excellent piece of reading that has and that can be interpreted in many, at many levels. I would just like to comment on it from a literary level, in the sense that in the writing that you do, it's you, the writer, while you are the experiential protagonist running along your route, in the reading and the, the, the style that you've written, You've actually taken me as a reader, as well as many of the people that will be reading this book through your journey as well. But whilst at a superficial level, it is just you talking about your medical experience. For me, from a, a reader's point of view, it caused me to reflect on my own life as well. In the sense that to getting where I have to get in my profession, what have I undergone? You have fortunately documented your journey. Uh, many people like myself have not done that particular journey. Maybe you've touched on it here and there, but you went into the heart and soul of the journey. And in taking people through it, you brought out the vulnerability that you spoke about. And that I think is the crux of this writing. We do have the perception that you guys as doctors, it's such a glamorous kind of lifestyle you have. You walk into the stethoscope, uh, your title, your white suit, and we look at you up there. But I think behind it all, is the doctor the human being? And like all of us, you are fallible. Uh, you have feelings, you have emotions. You have your successes and failures in your profession as well. And sometimes I think when we look at a doctor, we look at a person who's there with a the solution. And I think there's a lot of the experiences you've given, you've indicated how these very solutions affected your life personally, made you see the world through a different lens. And I think that is a message for all of us out as readers. It, it caused us to look at ourselves. And in this case, we looked at yourself through your very eyes. I would call that a piece of autoethnography, which is a study in its own right. There's a few thoughts I want to say or share with you in that 
I think your book is very inspirational in nature in the sense that you do allude to the fact that you had to work hard at school to get that place at the Nelson Mandela College. I come from a teaching background, and that's the message we try to give to all our learners. We try to instill in them, work hard now to reap the benefits later on. I think you very nicely in your inimicable style of joviality that you put in, the humaneness, the little anecdotes here and there, you've actually carried that very strong message through. That to succeed later in life, you've got to work at this point in time. So the issue of touching on the issue of discipline, for example, also brought in the challenge that we normally have. How do you balance your social life with your professional life or your life as a student? And I'd just like to, there was a comment that you had made that I'd like to read, which says on page 11, if you plan well ahead, I feel that there can always be enough time to socialize with your friends and expand your network. That is multiple messaging in it. And in life, you know, we generally have this tendency to say, you are the company that you keep. And that's actually a very strong philosophical, uh, what you call it, phrase, because it is true. You determine the life of those around you, but the same way those people around you determine your lives as well. But I think here the multiple messaging in the sense that if you have your direction in life, you will reach there. And the particular people that you gather around you will take you there. Conversely, in the same vein is that we have this challenge as educators with students and with people generally. How do you balance the two? And generally, we have a disjunction in our life when one overshadows the other. All work and no place in our I mean. But I think here, even as you're studying and going to this new phase of your life, you did manage to say we need to balance. We cannot be all work or all study. And I think that is something that the reader would reflect on going forward. I, I liked the fact that you spoke about this issue of the social and the professional, because if you look at people like Dr. Yogi, now, who are highly spiritual individuals, but who in the same way manage to bring the spirituality to the work that they do, it actually likens me to what you said. To be a good doctor, at the end of it, you say, you yourself have got to be healthy. And what is the definition of health? It's not just the medical. It's a psychological, it's a social, your community, etc. And if you look at the various activities that you and your brother went through, the Kung Fu training, the martial arts, etc., the comparisons that were given just now, you liken all of that to honing in your skills as a doctor. Because I, I tend to use the example of the students sometimes. You can't have a car and just shine only the fender. What about the rest of the car? And I think the messaging that you brought through here is it's important for the car to be healthy, but for every part of the car to be healthy. You don't lose one. You don't sacrifice one at the cost of the other. And that's a very strong message of the book itself. Uh, I just wanted to make a few comments that I've made, you know, written down here about the nature of your description. They're very lucid, they're very clear. But what I like most of it was in the conversational tone that you, you know, used. The anecdotes that came in broke the seriousness of what literature is about, and more importantly, what medicine is about. While your examples spoke on the nitty gritty that would be of great value to a medical student, and sometimes you don't really have the sufficiently enough as information to our matriculants, for example, or your grade 10s and 11s. You'd like to aspire to be a doctor, but what does it actually entail? I think from a student's perspective, you'd win a lot of people through, especially the youth, because you wrote it as a member of the youth fraternity. And while you've got the facts that are there, you colored it with the humaneness, the simplicity, the imaging. I like, for example, the image of the heart that you mentioned. When you touched a little bit of the issue of love, and you had this comparison between the physical heart and then the metaphorical heart. And how can an organ of that nature, a physical organ, have the impact it has on our daily lives when we look at our loved ones? So those little bits of imaging make this good literature and good writing. You've taken a, a serious topic and made it palatable, made it understandable. And of course, this can a uh, piece of writing can you know, uh, ingratiate itself to a professional in the medical field, a parent, a student, 
a researcher, etc. So it covers a quite a wide range of leadership. And that makes it good, really. And of course, as in the very fact, that it makes you reflect on yourself. And how seriously you take your own profession makes it good to say again, because it takes something away from your writing itself, you know? Uh, I just want to mention that in terms of the messaging to readers, I think you had multiple messaging. I just want to mention a few. Work hard now to repeat the benefits later. Our teachers say that to us, our parents say that to us. It's not often received the way you would intend it to be received. And I think yours was a classic case. Certainly now you can reflect, but to get where you are, you had to be a particular way when you were a student. The issue of awareness of technology, uh, you did mention the issue of artificial intelligence. I can tell you that that's a serious uh, topic at school level, at uh, university level, throughout the world, which technology is ever more working its way into our lives. But I think the critical point was there is no matter how much of artificial intelligence we get in the medical fraternity, you cannot really set aside the humaneness of a medical practitioner. The, the emotions and the spirituality that comes with it. No machine can take that. I think that's a strong message out there, especially our youth that are concerned that with artificial intelligence, we're going to lose our professions. I think we've got to look at alternative professions, yes. We've got to embrace the technology, but the humaneness cannot be taken away from our profession. If you look at the uh, issue of the coordination in your life, I just want to mention this is looking at the media, but <laughs> you seem to be a little bit of a personality when it comes to YouTube, uh, a bit of television, etc. And I think that's very refreshing because that is the arts. And when you look at the medical student or the medical fraternity, you look at the sciences. And it's very refreshing to say that there is a place for both in the life of an individual. I think also for me, a strong message there was that you could become a GP, you could become a specialist. But through what you've indicated there, for example, when you spoke of COVID and the coordination, that there are alternate means of careers and opportunities associated with the medical fraternity itself. All do not have to become GPs or pediatricians. There's, the industry itself is so wide and there's opportunities across the board. And sometimes students and prospective students of medicine don't really realize that. So I think you very tacitly brought that through when you brought your six years of experience in the different aspects. Where you gave, you actually gave a lot of information. So while I, I'm not sure if I can categorize this as a medical piece of writing, but I think from a literary point of view, you actually took a difficult concept like medicine and you made it understood by the common man, the common reader. Yet the content of it was also uh, pulled and imbued with a lot of uh, the medical aspects of your life. The inclusion of COVID, uh, I like the fact that you mentioned at some stage, I think you had a bit of an affliction. It tells us as people, you know, we said that the doctors are immune, not only to emotion, but also to physical illness. And it was good to see that you looked at the COVID from a patient's point of view. My GP himself, Dr. Duki, was actually in hospital for three months with COVID, which is a bit of a shocker because we said the doctors are well aware of everything. They know everything about COVID. They advise us. But this means that the humaneness of yourselves as doctors. And actually, I think it's an accolade to a lot of our doctors because now we appreciate as humans that you guys put yourself in the forefront of the pandemic. And sometimes maybe we don't appreciate that enough. I'm not saying you ask for thanks and appreciation. I'm saying sometimes we as individuals tend not to think about it, but you're not normal. Your guys are like Superman, you know, or Superwoman. I just want to end up by saying um, that page 177, which is towards the end, I'd like to end off with what you wrote. And you wrote there, I write this book to ease the journey, to leave a breadcrumb train for those who choose to travel this path. And that's very powerful because you're bridging the unknown with those who want to know and making it thus the norm. And I think at this young tender age of your life, before you're actually getting into the fraternity itself, you've actually already contributed to the medical fraternity by opening its doors to people that would not normally look in this direction. And you use the platform of literature to do it, where we don't, don't generally associate literature with medicine, but you did a combination of both. And I think that's a great accolade and so on. I think this odyssey you mentioned to the journey, yes, all of us go through different journeys in our lives. There are different odysseys. The importance of it is reaching that goal at the end. 
sometimes we know what the goal is and sometimes we don't. I think you were fortunate enough up front to know where you wanted to head. Some of us are still finding our golden grails and we're still undertaking our own policies. But I just want to end by congratulating you on an excellent piece of writing. I think you've portrayed the medical fraternity and the people within it as human beings, and that's a great message to all of us out there in terms of the way we looked at our doctors going forward. All the best for your medical career as well as your literary career. All the best. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm deeply touched Thank you by so <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, for sharing that deep insight on Ashik Ji's book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey. Indeed, we've come to the end of episode nine of Pustaka Lok, a light of a book, with today's episode showcasing the book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey by author Ashik Paramchand. I'd like to invite Mr. Sipi Vayam Chunu from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban to render this evening's vote of thanks. Oscar. Greetings to all of you. On behalf of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, I am so delighted today to deliver a vote of thanks on today's ninth episode of the program, Booster Kalok, Light of the Book. Today's discussion was about the book, The Great Medical Student Odyssey by Mr. Ashik Premchan. This wonderful book is very touching and it also gives us a new meaning in the medical world. So to Ashik Ji, Thank you very much for this book, Daniel Baji. Allow me to thank all those who took part on today's program. I will start with the author himself, Mr. Ashik Pramchanji, a medical student and an author, Ms. Zainab Priya Adala, author and a poet for the great remarks that she gave this evening, Mr. Ishk Pramchand, a medical student, Dr. Reina Abraham, medical doctor, and lastly, our Dr. Bhuvan Prakash Singh, an author and uh, educator, for giving a summary of this wonderful book, The Great Medical Student of Odyssey. To all of them, Ashik Ji, Zainab Ji, Ishki Ji, Reina Ji, Bhuvan Ji, Danyabhat for taking part on today's program. To Dr. Chaitana Prakash Yogi, Director of Swami Vivekananda Kacharat Center, Sisti Harinarayan, Sri Karen Singh, to all of you once again, thank you for taking part on today's program. To all those who participated online, we'd like to say thank you for taking time to be with us this evening. Please visit our Facebook page for updated of all our cultural activity that is coming from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center in Devon. To all of you, once again, Ashik Ji, Zainab Ji, Ish Ji, Reina Ji, Bhuvan Ji, thank you, you're such a wonderful people. To other people, to all of them, I would like to say, have a wonderful evening. Namaskar.